I think we are ready to start. More people are going to be coming in. Thank you, everyone, to, 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 like, you know, to join us today, to have joined us today. Um, we have a very special uh, speaker. Uh, I've been following Russ for years, literally for years, and I don't follow <laughs> many people. <laughs> if you guys are on LinkedIn, you know that. Uh, after you do marketing for a while, you become really selective. You know, you want to make sure that you're getting kind of the best. Yeah. And Russ, just the insight that, that he provides. Um, definitely, if you're, if you're not following him on LinkedIn, go ahead and do that, and you will thank me for it. Um, and uh, sure since he had been talking also really about content distribution, content amplification, I'm like, you know what, we got to get him to do a, a session with us because this is such an important topic. Uh, everybody produces yeah. content nowadays. Everybody produces content. No one knows how to do the yeah. marketing side of content marketing. Um, I'm not going to talk right. for too long, but we have a couple of polls. So it would be interesting just to kind of like, you know, to understand the, the audience who are joining us. Um, and let's see, so I'm going to launch the first poll, which is basically just kind of asking you where you work, uh, whether you're working in-house or an agency. And, uh, and let's see if you are answering. Russ, can you see the results, by the way? I'm not sure if you can or is it just me. I can't see the results yet. I just see the poll. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the results. So working for an agency right now. Uh, I would say about 60% of our attendees work in an agency and then uh, in-house is split between SaaS, literally six, 61%. <laughs> nice, and, nice. Uh, and then in-house is divided equally between SaaS, e-com, and, and other. Right. Uh, gonna That's awesome. Just like, you know, let me see. Yeah, almost everybody voted. So let's see. Let's, okay, so we're going to end up and this poll let's jump into another question and it's usually I, I like to ask these questions just like you know it, it gives you know, our speaker kind of also an idea about about the yeah audience. no it's good to know definitely so i'm gonna i'm gonna also ask our audience to tell us to tell us to tell us what do you focus on uh, are you a content marketer or an seo or a digital marketer or a cro or other I, I put other for myself usually and they're like what is that I'm like, oh, I, I am an other <laughs> you know okay so it is very It's much always interesting because with things like this, it's like, do you associate yourself if you're a content marketer with digital marketing or are you content marketing? Are you SEO? Like you can have so many different uh, factors. We're all like onions. I always say different layers, right? There you go. There you go. Uh, hey, hey, Ben, really good to see you. Uh, ben is uh, from 360 Sales Growth. Awesome. You know, he's, he's looking at also been looking forward. Okay, so this is this is an interesting interesting mix. So content marketers we have seventeen percent, um, SEOs thirteen percent, CRO thirteen percent, digital marketer in general is thirty three percent, and then other. Um, so I'm guessing that's people like me that do <laughs> everything. That's about 20, uh, 25 uh, twenty five percent. Um, and let's see if we had a third question so i'm gonna i'm gonna ask like in a couple of things like you know uh, in terms of uh, content marketing what's the hardest part of content marketing let's launch this poll and see what people say hey kristen and so kristen is the ceo of ceo of uh, over w8 it's a digital brand agency from munich so we have some audience from from europe um and Everybody, by the way, is excited. Then you can see it in the in the chat. Russ, everybody's excited That's just awesome. to attend. Um, this is this is interesting. So where people are struggling. Um, so by the way, it's consistent as you see over here. Content distribution, sixty four percent, and I allow people to select multiple answers because of that. Hey, yeah. I'm struggling with with multiple things. Uh, so coming up with content ideas is at nineteen percent. Creating the content is at thirty seven percent. Content distribution is a 63%. Um, nice. And right. let's see. So last couple of questions, and this is, Russ, you had asked me to ask those. So let's go ahead and, and ask this yeah. and we'll be ready to start. How much time do you spend on creating content in a week? Five hours, five to 10 hours, 10 to 20 hours, or more than 20 hours. So for us, oh my God, like you should, I should, at some point I should share the Trello board for creating content. Um, <laughs> Because we have an outline, and then the yeah. outline, like you know, after that goes for approval, right? And then that, there's first draft, and then that goes for approval, second draft, and then we interview people for the article, and then there's graphics that go into the article, and then there's the main thing that goes for the article, and then there's distribution, which, I mean, distribution itself is like you know about like twenty different places where we distribute the content. 
Yeah, so it's a lot. Yeah. And I, every time like Simba goes through this, I'm like, man, I'm like, I wonder how your hair didn't turn looking white. <laughs> that's hilarious. Look, look at that. So, okay. So this is, this is interesting. Less than five hours. That's about, oh, people are still answering. So it changed it literally as I'm telling you. It's about 27%. Five to okay. 10 hours. That's 19%. Now, uh, this is interesting. 10 to 20 hours at 27%. More than 20 hours is at 27%. So... More oh, wow. than 10 to 20, more than 20. That is, that is, that is a lot. And then the last question um, that we're going to ask is how much time do you spend actually uh, on content distribution? Um, that's, so we talked about the content uh, creation. Now, if you're spending more than 20 hours on content creation, how much does that leave for, for distribution? Right. Um, Let's see, let's see. So the answers are coming through. And, and by the way, what do you think? What do you think, Russ? What, what's, which I think one? most people are gonna say less than five hours. That's my it, estimate. It is definitely heading in that direction. Uh, yeah. We are with 72% votes. We have 62% are saying less than five hours. Right. Uh, five yeah. to 10 hours is at 18%. 10 to 20 hours, that's 20%. So it's interesting, okay. but the, the majority yeah. is 60%. Yeah. All right, it's spending more time. Awesome. I, I think I think with these results that we've shared, we're excited. Um, yeah, Russ, all yours. I'm gonna mute. Uh, I'm gonna watch the Q and A. Um, awesome. And I'll let you. I'll let you. I'll let you do your thing. So it's all yours. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. So, folks, I'm I'm super excited to give this talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about designing your content marketing engine, and your content marketing engine is essentially the 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 process of both creation and distribution. So, when I look at those numbers, when I look at that survey, it uh, it fires me up a little bit because I'm excited to dive into both of those. I've been preaching for years about the importance of uh, content and distribution, and I think I've cracked um, essentially a formula and a framework that organizations and even freelancers, individuals, agencies, in-house or uh, contractors, you name it, can essentially leverage to really take their content marketing efforts to the next level. Um, before we jump in though, I do want to take you back into time a little bit. I want to take you back into time when I was a little kid and I grew up in my parents' basement, just kind of loving and being obsessed with what I think all of you probably have seen some familiarity with, which is the good old Disney classics. So when I think about Mulan, when I think about Aladdin, when I think about Lion King, when I think about those movies, they have a very deep and personal connection to my heart and to my soul. And I used to get so close to the TV to watch these shows, to watch those movies. I loved the Disney classics. Um, and I know that there's a whole generation that grew up watching things like Up, and I am all in on saying, yes, Up is great, but I am a believer in the classics. I love the classics, the classic cartoons, Pocahontas, uh, Aladdin, etc. Like those are my jam. That's my era. That's what I was obsessed with. And I could spend hours glued to my TV in my parents' house, just watching these shows day after day, night after night. And my parents would come downstairs and they'd be like, Ross, stay away from your screen. Your eyes are going to go bad. You're going to go blind if you stay too close to the screen. Now, we all know as marketers, as creators, you're all very close to your screen today. So guess what? Our parents lied to us. For all those years, they were telling us that our eyes would go bad, that we would lose our eyesight. That wasn't actually real. It didn't happen. Now we walk around with VR sets on our eyes, running around the streets, and the screens are right in front of our face. And we all have these devices within arm's length right now. Like seriously, how many people right now as you're on here, I'm curious, just say in the chat, yes, me, me, or I do, I do, guilty as um, kind of uh, claimed, how many of you right now are within arm's reach of two devices? Like two devices right now you could touch. I guarantee you, there's a lot of you out there. Just say in the chat, guilty. Exactly. We all do. We're connected to these devices every single day, everywhere we look. And for some reason, we were told that we had to stay away from them. Uh, my mom was over for Mother's Day and she gave me a, a dirty look when I said it, but she had her iPad and it was like over her face. You know, as you get older, your eyes do get bad. She was holding her iPad up to her face and I was like, mom, you're way too close to the screen. Your eyes are going to go bad. And then she just gave me that mom stare, that mom look, because she knew that I was using her old line against her. Um, but that's not my point. My point is this, that content that we were so obsessed with back in the day was so good that it was worth getting close to the screen for 
the content that we can create as marketers, as creators should also be that good. It should also be so good that it's worth us getting to the screen for. And my hope is in this presentation to show you not only how you can create content that is that good, but also how you can distribute that content consistently so it reaches the right people on the channels that they're spending time on. One thing that is also important that we recognize though, is that it has never been a better time to be a creator, but it has never been a harder time to be a creator. And the reason why it's never been so hard is because there is so much content being developed week after week, month after month. If you were to able to stack all of the content that is being created, all of the data, all of the content that is being created every single week, you would actually be able to circle the earth 222 times if you were to go into the old school playbook and kind of create DVDs with all of that information. There is so much information that is out there, which makes it more difficult for us to create content that ultimately stands out amongst this noise. But that's our job. That's what we need to do. And I believe one of the best organizations that we can use for inspiration around how we can essentially do this is to look at companies like Disney. Now, Disney, some of you might be working in B2B, some of you might have an agency, some of you are thinking, Ross, what in the world does Disney as a creator have to do with me? And here's something that I want you to remember. Disney is truly one of the best content creation and distribution organizations ever. And my hope is through this presentation to show you how they were able to do it so successfully to create a massively successful business. If you look at the most grossing films year after year, it's Disney. Why are they always at the top? There's a framework that they have used and embraced for both the creation and distribution of their movies, of their, their properties that I think you can leverage in your own work as well. So let me take you back into time again, back to when Disney was first created. Walt Disney, the creator of Disney, created this framework. This was what they called the Disney creation model. It was the methodology and the approach that every single Disney movie went through before it hit the theaters. They leveraged this whole concept, and I'm gonna talk you through it, to create the classics, the Aladdins, the Disneys, the Dumbos, you name it. All of the classics came out of this essential creation model. This graphic, this visual that you're looking at here was created way before I was born, way before probably most of you were born. And it was developed to act as the essence of how Disney creates content. And you can take a lot of inspiration from it. So let's start at the top. It all starts with Walt. So back then, Walt was, yes, that individual, Walt Disney. But over time, that shifted. It started to become the story writers, the directors, et cetera. Walt started to become essentially an essence of what it means to be um, a Disney movie. When you think about your brand story, when you think about your message, you want to start there as well. You want to understand the fundamental core message that you want to convey to the world day after day. What's your mantra? What is the message that you want to leave people with? What is the feeling that you want to leave people with? And once you have that, that becomes your brand essence and that goes into every single story you create. Whether it's a webinar, whether it's a blog post, whether it's a tweet, whether it's an Instagram story, it doesn't matter. All of the, the core essence goes into that story and then you're going to have moving parts that go with it you're going to have writers that come in you're going to have images uh, you're going to have all of the various pieces that kind of help make that piece a little bit special within disney you have things like animation you have the ink and pink ink and paint team, you have the music, uh, you have art props, you have live action studio professionals, you have stats, you have a nurse on set, you have all of these moving parts and at the core of it, you have the director. So from that director though, the director is going to also work with the sound team, they're gonna work with the cutting, etc. This is the middle of the content engine where the actual development of an asset takes place. Once the asset is developed, it goes to the lab. And the lab could be seen internally within our types of organizations as someone who's essentially going to be the final person to cross your T's and dot your I's. This is the final editor, or this is the, the owner of the content assets that you are publishing and creating. And once you do get past that lab process, and they have said, this piece is amazing. You've stayed true to the Walt essence. It has brought in the right imagery. It's brought in the right sounds, etc. We are now going to pass, it up, pass this off to the distribution engine, which is Walt Disney Presents. Now, we'll dive into that shortly as well. But essentially, this model is very similar to the model that most organizations embrace when it comes to creation. It starts with an idea. It starts with a high level idea of what your brand is trying to communicate. From there, you develop a framework. That framework is essentially an idea of, okay, these are the key points that we want to have. These are the key factors that we want to discuss in this video or in this series, et cetera. Then you craft that first draft. It gets reviewed, edited, fine-tuned, goes to a final draft, and then it goes out to the public and it is published. 
the same similar concept that Disney leveraged to essentially bring to life some of the best movies of all time is the methodology that you can use within your company to create great content as well. Now, here's a very fundamental understanding that not a lot of marketers realize, and that is this. Content as you create it, content as you consume it, is one of the most influential and powerful things that exist today. Content is the foundation of culture. And what I mean by that is when you look back over time, there has never been anything that has shaped humans and our perspectives in history than content. Whether it's the books we read, whether it's the stories our parents tell us when we're kids, whether it's the movies that we watch, whether it's the, the content that we consume on a screen, content fundamentally shapes the way that we think, behave, and act which is why for organizations, it is so important that you value the content that you are creating because it does have a meaningful impact on the lives of other people. But in addition to that, we have to understand that internally within our organizations, we have to have a content culture that recognizes the power of this and recognizes that content can be influential and that every single piece of content that you publish is not just an expense. It's not just a cost on your bottom line. These are assets that you are developing. The same way that on a Friday night, it is very great and enjoyable experience for me to sit down and watch Lion King with my kids, the same way in 2020 as it was in 1998 when I did it with my parents, that is an asset that Disney created that still adds value to the lives of others. But for some reason, we believe that these assets that we create when we press publish on them after spending 20 hours, some of us, to create, that's the end of it. We press publish, we send out a tweet, we send out an email, and we call it a day. But in reality, that is the beginning of the life cycle for that asset that you were originally invested in. So another point that I want to speak to around why these are assets, if you go back to 2008, um, 2008 was a very, very difficult time in the world of marketing and just in the world in general. We got hit with the recession. Some of you were around for it. I was around for it. I bought my first stock in 2007. By 2008, it hit $2. It was a disgrace. It was a very bad time, especially for someone fresh out of university. But if you go back to that, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned about riding the wave and recognizing the value of thinking long term. When you go back to Google Trends and you look at the amount of people who were looking for social media marketing back in 2008, was relatively low in comparison to the amount of people looking at social media marketing today. Software as a service, SaaS, again, in 2008, there was not a lot of people talking about it. But if you fast forward and you take a zoomed out approach, you can see that the value of content increases in time, meaning that a post that you would have published back in 2008 about social media marketing would have been relatively low value, but over time it would have increased that value because more people would have looked for it, more people would have found it, more people would have engaged with it, et cetera. But for some reason, again, amidst pandemics, amidst chaos, people oftentimes will scale back on their marketing efforts because they have the inability to think long-term, which is what is key. And I hope that again, we can talk about the importance of this um, through today's session and talk about how you can create some great content. So, all right, let's say you're bought in. Ross, I believe you, I understand what you're saying. I believe that you should create a content engine internally and I believe you should create great content. How do you do it? So I wanna talk you through, again, some tactical insights around how you can create great pieces of content. And first and foremost, I wanna flag folks, you do not have to be the James Cameron of content creation. You don't have to be the next Picasso of content creation. Even when you look at the early sketches of Star Wars, right? They, they weren't the most prettiest things. Like look at Princess Leia. It's not a great sketch. These are the original sketches from Star Wars and they were not like very well thought out and well tuned. Over time, they improved. So again, if on day one, you're not creating content excellence, that's okay. You will improve with time. And as you start to fine tune your story, you're going to improve with it. So how can you create great content? I think before you start to press publish on new pieces, the first thing you need to do though is actually look at the content you've created in the past. What content have you already developed? View those as assets. We've talked about this already. View every single piece of content that you published as an asset in the same way that you would consider your stock portfolio, the stocks that you invest in, the bonds, et cetera, as a portfolio, you wanna consider that content that you published in the past as a portfolio that it's time to revisit. What do I mean by revisiting? you're going to review it and look for ways to optimize it. At Foundation, we have this thing that we call the four R's. And the four R's are broken out into a simple concept. Remix that content, revise that content, remove that content, and redirect it. This is also the fundamental efforts that Disney has used for years. And I'll talk about that shortly as well. 
But this concept is also baked into the culture of content at Disney. Let me explain. So if you look at some of the most popular movies that Disney published in the last few years, what do these all have in common? They were all published in the 90s and 70s and 80s. Like these are old movies that Disney just added new technology to and made them feel good again, right? They took existing content that they already had the story on. They said, okay, we had, um, we had, so, we had um, who was it? I forget who it was. They had so-and-so play Simba back in the day. We're going to have someone else play Simba today. We had so-and-so play Dumbo. We're going to now add some 3D graphics to it. Uh, that is essentially the model that they did. And they continuously are using this model of just remixing old stories and bringing them back to life. So you can take the same methodology. You published a great piece in 2019. It shouldn't die in 2019 revise it, add new stats to it, add new figures to it, that ebook that you created, add new life to it, etc. And recognize it's okay to have some flops. The same way that Disney also continuously is in creating new movies that are spin-offs of old pieces, you will never hear anyone talk about the Lion King one and a half, right? Like nobody is saying my favorite Disney movie is Lion King one and a half because it was a flop. But at the same time, it is okay because at that moment when they first did that remix of this piece of content, it resonated with folks. People liked it, people enjoyed it. Um, it might've been a small sample size, but it did the job for those people. And now Disney no longer talks about um, Lion King two and a half or 101, 101 Dalmatians three. Like they don't talk about these movies. They're nowhere on their website. You have to dig into their Wikipedia page to find them. They recreated these stories, but they didn't put a lot of energy into them. So you have to think about it as well as it's okay to fail once in a while and have some content that flops because nobody's going to remember it. They're going to remember the hits. Another opportunity that exists is to remove content that you no longer need. So if you go to Disney's website, you're not going to see mentions of Lion King one and a half. Why? Because Disney has erased that from its catalog. It doesn't want you to find it. The same thing can be done with your site. If you have a blog, if you've been publishing for years, find content that is generating very little traffic and remove it. There's tons of studies that have been done that show by deleting old content, by removing those pieces, you can actually see an increase in the amount of traffic to your site. So don't be afraid to do that as well. Now, I want to solidify another factor into why remixing is so important. And let's think about Lion King. Right? Like Lion King is one of the classics from Disney, but essentially it's Hamlet. It's Hamlet remixed with lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, like it is the exact same concept of Hamlet, except turned into a cartoon. So there's an insight here. And the insight is when you are thinking about the content that you should be creating in the, in the future, don't be afraid to remix content that worked extremely well in the past. And this can be from other industries. This can be from other spaces. This can be from within your own industry. This is, can be from leaders who have kind of created great content in the past, but have no longer continuously optimized and refined their work. And I believe in this strategy called the Sherlock Homeboy approach that you should embrace to kind of do this. Let me give you an example of what the Sherlock Homeboy approach is and why you should embrace this methodology when it comes to finding these opportunities and then creating content. So let's say you were to use something like the Wayback Time Machine. I would plug a website that is kind of one of the um, ideal brands in my space that I want to kind of be like, and I'd look at what type of content were they creating in the early days that I can use for inspiration around the content I should create in the future. So if you type in Salesforce or HubSpot and you're in the world of SaaS, you're going to look at through Wayback Time Machine, what type of content was Salesforce creating back then? What type of content was HubSpot creating when they first arrived? And you can start to see that they're creating posts like the must read inbound marketing predictions and resources for 2010. So I do that same piece, but for 2020, I do the same piece here around the next wave of transparency. Will your business be like windows or wall in 2010? So I revise that a bit and I say, okay, the next wave of transparency, what is it for 2021? You adjust and you remix these stories to your modern time. So you use Wayback Time Machine to kind of get inspiration and then you add your own special sauce, your own industry spin and your own expertise to something that was already created. You want to study those who have kind of set the standard of content excellence within your space and then apply those methodologies to your own business. There was a study done among CMOs by Christine Mormon where she surveyed over 1,500 CMOs and asked, what were the brands that you look up to? If there's brands that you look up to, study the things that they did to achieve excellence and then use that 
to guide your own inspiration around content that you should create in the future. Another thing that we do that it tends to be very valuable and helpful with this whole Sherlock Homeboy approach, which is essentially reverse engineering the success of others, is we wanted to create content that generated backlinks. So how do we do that? We went to some of the top blogs in marketing. We looked at the Moz blog, CoSchedule, Backlinko, et cetera. We took all of those sites. We exported a spreadsheet with all of the titles for their blog posts. We identified the types of content that they were creating and how many backlinks their pieces of content were generating. We took this to gain insight into what types of pieces of, of content do we need to create that will generate backlinks. So we did an analysis and we tur it turned out that the number one piece of content that these companies were publishing that generated backlinks were tools. That's interesting. The second most popular were definitions, followed by stats, followed by research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that if you wanna create a tool, it's gonna be very expensive. So we said, okay, let's try something a little bit less expensive. Let's run with creating content like stats. Let's take a bunch of stats from various spaces and start writing pieces about them. So we took that, we created a bunch of stat posts just like this. And essentially we created pieces like 48 eye-opening LinkedIn stats for B2B marketers, 34 mind-blowing Instagram stats for B2B marketers, 15 core stats for marketers need to know, et cetera. Within minutes of pressing publish on the LinkedIn piece and then distributing it on social, we started to see the links start rolling in. Sure, the LinkedIn post with Oda question kind of took off and took on a life of its own. It's been linked to by some amazing sources and we've been able to increase the amount of links to this continuously week after week, month after month without doing any backlink outreach. And this is again, all because we embraced that Sherlock Homeboy approach of actually studying what other people in the industry were doing to see what they were generating backlinks to, such as definitions, and then using that for inspiration around what we should be creating to create some content that will ultimately get backlinks as well. For one day, we actually ranked number one in Google for the word LinkedIn. Whenever somebody typed in LinkedIn, the foundation's article was actually showing up on the front page of Google. Of course, the traffic was trashed. Those people wanted to get to their LinkedIn account. They didn't want to get to our post, but they were getting to our website because of this. And this is all again, because we were able to leverage that reverse engineering Sherlock homeboy approach. Also do this on other channels, right? I think there's a lot of value in getting inspiration from other channels, other sources that you might be overlooking. And for some reason, we oftentimes as marketers will stay inside of the dashboards and the tools, the Trellos, the spreadsheets, the Mozes, the Ahrefs, et cetera, without actually going to the platforms that people are consuming the content. And the reason why this is important is because you can reverse engineer even YouTube content. And YouTube content can offer you a lot of insight into what type of content you should also be creating. So let's say I ran a gardening blog. I'm gonna go to YouTube and I'm going to type in things like propagation. And I'm gonna say, okay, maybe I should create a series on propagating basil. I should create a series on propagating dandelions, propagating um, rosemary, etc. You can start to get inspiration for all of these different pieces. And then you can type these phrases that you're discovering into your keywords um, tool. So let's say I did type in um, propagating succulents or propagating um, basil. I then figure out, oh, look at all of these different things that people are looking for related to propagating different plants. From that, I can start to look at the volume that these pieces are generating a month. And I can be like, okay, this is interesting. There might be a real opportunity here. But if I don't go to YouTube to actually start doing additional searches, I might be actually surprised to find that while these are only saying I'm gonna generate about a couple thousand or so um, visits a month on YouTube, these sites, these actual channels are generating on these videos, hundreds of thousands of views, right? Like between all three of these, there's 455,000 views. That's a lot of traffic that you could generate if you are creating content surrounding these searches. That's a massive gap from what I actually seen in the actual keyword research tool. So again, you wanna leverage the idea of doing the Sherlock Homeboy approach for research, but you don't end with just that type of content. You wanna study the sitemaps of your favorite sites. So go in and study the sitemaps that they're using and start to again, think about what type of content are they creating? Why do they have these resource pages? Why do they have these pricing pages? And then again, use that to inspire content that you should be creating in the future. Now, another opportunity that I believe exists that is often overlooked is going to the actual SERP, so the search engine results page. You wanna type in something like best CRM, and then you're gonna categorize what shows up when you type this in. You're gonna see that the first piece is a list, the second one is a list, the third is a directory, the fourth is a list, and then the final one is a sales page. Now, this is where it gets interesting. 
a lot of these are lists and lists do extremely well. But what is rare is to see a sales page show up when you're typing best CRM. So if I'm a CRM company, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse engineer why this HubSpot page is actually being so successful here. One of the things that's going to be initially triggered is the fact that, okay, they say best CRM for small businesses and it says the date. Maybe I need to ensure that the date is included in my title. Is that something that I can leverage? Because this page itself, this keyword is generating 6,000 searches a month. If I can have a page that ranks for this, there's a lot of value there. Again, remember, the new Lion King is the Lion King also revised. So you want to take inspiration from content that is already doing well, and you want to apply your own methodology to it and then bring it to life the same way that Disney would do it. There's a ton of value in leveraging that approach. And you probably already know this trick, but here's another one that I think folks should recognize as an opportunity. If you can recreate content completely like Disney does, where you take an old classic and you bring it fully to life with modern, aesthetic, et cetera, do it. But it's also okay on YouTube to just update the date. So for example, this video has, was uploaded back in November, 2018, and the owner of the video just changes the title every year to Tesla's strategy in 2010 comprehensive overview. So, the, or 2020 comprehensive overview. In two months, they're gonna do the same thing and that's gonna say 2021. And in four months or eight months time, it's probably gonna say 2022. They keep updating the date and this page, this video continuously ranks even though it was originally uploaded back in 2018. It's a simple trick, it's a simple hack, but ultimately it works well if you wanna distribute your video content that may be getting a little bit dated. Now, here's another technique where I think it's important to recognize. Amidst COVID, a big insight has come to light that a lot of people are overlooking, and that is that the writing is on the wall for Google's product roadmap around what they want to be in the future. When you type in corona cases in your, coronavirus cases in your specific region or area, you are going to be met with on Google, not a link to your government website or a popular website related to health or experts. You're going to be met with the answer to that question directly in the search engine results page. You're gonna be able to learn about symptoms, you're gonna be able to learn about prevention techniques, et cetera. All of this information directly in the Google SERP without clicking a single link. Their source, Wikipedia. So Google is taking the content that exists on other sites and you can do this now, you can do tests on this across any different search. If you type in the best marketing books, if you type in the best um, music albums for 2020, whatever, you're gonna notice you don't actually have to click on links anymore. Google is giving you that information. This is very risky for marketers who believe that if you press publish and you rank in Google, that you're gonna be good. It's difficult because this means Google is no longer just a place to distribute websites. Google is now a destination. And when Google becomes a destination, it's gonna be more difficult for marketers, especially in the content world, to actually generate that traffic. So I suggest that you take a page right out of YouTube's, out of Google's book, where you look at the content that might exist on a Wikipedia page. And then similar to the way that Disney took Hamlet and re revised it and remixed it to fit their own world, I suggest you do the same thing with Wikipedia. If I'm running a gardening blog, I'm gonna to go to the history of gardening, that entire Wikipedia page. I'm gonna reverse engineer all of the various sections, et cetera, and I'm gonna create a piece of content that is 10 times better than what exists on Wikipedia today. I'm gonna to inject modern design. I don't know about you, but Wikipedia was, is not the most attractive site in the world. Sure, it's user-friendly, it provides great value, but if you can create an amazing visual um, the appealing version of the history of gardening, I have a feeling that you can outrank Google. I mean, outrank Wikipedia for their own page. All you have to do is go in depth with your content, create something special. Um, and there's brands that have done this, right? Like if you look at this one on the left, it's very difficult to read versus this one on the right, which is very easy to read. Which one would you rather read? You're gonna rather read the one on the right because it's easier to digest. And this was something put together by a company called Growth Design, um, where they actually took some of the biases that people have and took the entire Wikipedia page and just turned it into a landing page. They were able to generate um, thousands of subscribers in just two days. They were able to make the front page of Product Hunt um, and they just constantly are updating this piece, which is essentially a revised version of a Wikipedia page and they're generating tons of traction around this. So you've published all of this good content. You've done the Sherlock Homeboy approach. You now understand where you need to go. You've optimized content that you have. You completely are bought into this idea of creating valuable content. You're pressing publish. What do you do next? What do you do next? Next, you distribute that content. In the same way that Disney has an amazing content creation engine, they have an amazing distribution engine as well. This is the distribution engine that 
Disney has leveraged for years to spread their materials, to spread their IP across a variety of different ways. It starts with essentially the creation of the film. And then once that film is published, it's gonna to go to things like TV. The music is gonna be sold through CDs, through um, Shopify, Spotify now. Uh, back then it could have been through Napster, et cetera. It goes through merchandising licensing. It goes out to Disneyland where they decide whether or not they were gonna create an actual ride about it. They're selling um, different pieces of the IP in the shops, the art. They have comic strips, magazines, et cetera. This is the distribution engine to take one IP, one idea, one concept, and then spread it across a wide range of different places. And that's what you have to do as well. When you look at Google, I've mentioned it before, it is becoming very, very difficult to stand out, which is why I believe distribution needs to be a priority. And Reid Hoffman put this amazing quote out there um, a few years ago where he said, if you are not building the strategy of product distribution into what you are doing, then you are relying entirely on a form of running into a field with a metal pole, hoping that lightning will strike. And that's not usually a winning strategy. And the same thing exists with content marketing. People press publish on content, hoping that the world will find it, hoping that it will automatically be seen. But in reality, it just is met with crickets. And that's not an area that you wanna be in. Hope is not a strategy. You want to distribute your content effectively. And my hope is in this half of the presentation to show you exactly how to do that. So before I jump into some tactical things that you can run with, I want to give you a bit of a better understanding of why this is so important. Similar to the um, insight around the fact that if you were to create content years ago, it would be worth a lot more today. When it comes to cost per acquis for acquisition, um, customer acquisition costs, there's no question that it is higher now than it ever was before. And this is because the market continues to be more saturated because more people are paying to acquire customers. And this is across both B2B and B2C. When you see numbers like this, where you can see that the amount of people who are investing in cost per click is significantly higher, nearly 70% higher than it was six years ago. The writing is on the wall that the cost to actually acquire your customers if you're not embracing organic distribution is going to continuously hot, um, rise. And if you back uh, track a few months ago amidst COVID when it was at its peak, you can remember that tons of media budgets were all getting slashed. And these companies who were investing so heavily in paid actually took a significant ding in their ability to kind of come out of things um, in a positive way because they had no organic traffic. They had no organic distribution. So they were able, they weren't able to kind of recoup the fallout of having their paid media budgets put on pause. And some of you might be still feeling that pain today where you cut back so significantly on your media budgets in Q1, Q2, that you're, no, you're now kind of far off from achieving your goals. And my hope is that you understand the importance of organic distribution so you don't find yourself in that case again in the future. So I love R words. Here's three R's that I think that you should embrace when it comes to your content creation efforts. First, reshare, repost, and remix. What does that mean? You're going to reshare content that you published in the past. You're going to repost content onto different channels and you're going to remix content that you published last week into a new format and distribute that to your community and your audience. Let's dive into that. So back in 2019, I wrote this piece about um, what essentially uh, the unbundling of Excel and how Excel is essentially turning into a handful of different profitable companies. Press publish on this piece. It generates a bunch of traction, but that's not the last day that I promote that piece. I promote that piece again shortly after. For some reason, we have this belief inside of the world of marketing that if you press publish on a piece in June, you can't republish that piece in October. You can. Don't be afraid to redistribute that content, reshare your content on social because the people who follow you today are not going to be the exact same people who follow you in Q3 2021. So it is okay to share that piece of content that you published this month again in the future. Don't be afraid to promote your work. The more you promote your content, the more that you promote your stories, the more opportunities you're going to open up for yourself. And there's no question that there is a direct relationship with how much content you're producing and promoting with the amount of people who you're gonna have organically subscribing to your content, whether it's on LinkedIn, your newsletter, your Twitter account, et cetera. Um, 
Also, don't be afraid to repost this content to different communities. So Hacker News happens to be a place where my target audience spends a lot of time. At Foundation, we work with SaaS companies primarily, as well as B2B brands working in very boring industries. Um, amongst the SaaS side, Hacker News is a place where a lot of SaaS founders spend time. So what do we do? We go to Hacker News, uh, we submit our link to this community, people upvote it, people rank it, um, or people engage with it, they comment on it, et cetera. And we were able to generate tons of traction off of that one piece being submitted into that community. So don't be afraid to go to these communities, find the communities that your audience is spending time on and submit your content to these communities for the community to get value from. Of course, you will get blocked from any community if you're just spamming them and not adding value. That is why it's important that you ensure that you're actually starting with a bit of understanding of what type of content this community wants. And to speak to that just a little bit, Remember we were talking about the Sherlock Homeboy approach earlier? Another great way to ensure that your content doesn't get you banned and kicked off of these various channels is to actually go into these communities and sort the content by top posts. If you went into a subreddit, if you go into Hacker News, look at the content that was at the top of those communities and then again, use that insight to inspire and create what type of content you should be developing in the future. Um, for example, this is me using the Remix model on my own content. I saw that the unbundling of Excel piece generated a lot of traction. So what do I do? I create another piece called the unbundling of G Suite, where we break down the various ways that G Suite is being broken apart. And I don't just press publish on it once, I press publish on it multiple times. It's been shared on my Twitter account probably four or five times. We then send it over to communities like AngelList. We submit it into their forum. We send it over to Hacker News again. We submit it to Reddit, et cetera. You always want to rem remix content, but then throw it back into your distribution engine. If you're not sure of the various ways that you can distribute content, we do have a free cheat sheet that we've put together. It has over a hundred different ways that you can spread your content, whether it's through email, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, various subreddits, communities, Twitter storms, Twitter posts, etc. Just send me a text to this number, distro sheet, and we'll send you that a text right away that has uh, an actual spreadsheet that you can use to keep track of where your content is being spread. If you actually plug in your RSS into this spreadsheet, we'll pull the titles for you and it will actually allow you to kind of just check off the items as your content is being spread. So check this spreadsheet out, completely free to use. Again, embrace your Sherlock homeboy. This is how you're going to find ways to spread your content the most effectively. For example, we use things like SimilarWeb and what that offers us is the insight to see how other brands are spreading their content. So let's say I'm in the world of finance and I wanna compete with Investopedia. I'm gonna plug Investopedia in here and I'm gonna to start to see insights. I'm gonna see, oh, they're doing a consistent 31% of their referring traffic is coming from Yahoo Finance. Does that mean I need to build a relationship with Yahoo Finance and start controlling contributing to their site as a guest blogger, what does that look like? Or I see that they're getting seven, uh, two percent of their traffic from medium.com. That's interesting. So what can I do there? Can I reach out to folks on medium and start distributing my content there? So this is something that we've actually done at foundation. We will republish content on our blog that might not be working too well or content that is essentially a little bit mediocre that didn't take off as we planned or is just getting older and then redistribute that content on medium.com. Why is that powerful? It's powerful because you're able to tag content on medium as SaaS, for example. And then this piece, once it's published on medium, is it gonna go directly to the people who are on that medium channel following it, et cetera. Another opportunity on Medium that exists is to actually find some of the top publications that exist on Medium and then take old content and submit it as a guest post for medium.com. I always say, for years, marketers viewed guest blogging as a great way to generate backlinks. The best game that you can play today is not worrying about backlinks for guest blogging, but to worry about reach. And if you can take an old blog post that you published in 2019 that is generating very few views and then republish it on Medium and start to generate an entire new audience, this piece was actually, um, it generated about 50 or so thousand views a year for us on the foundation site. It was starting to flatline, so we republished it on Medium and it got us 23,000 views. Um, and that's the opportunity that exists, right? That's the opportunity that exists when you republish your content on other sites. Don't be afraid to tap into someone else's audience. But also, don't be afraid to go into very relevant communities. So again, let's go back to that gardening idea that we talked about before. 
if I run a gardening blog, I'm not going to just press publish on those various gardening um, pieces of content that I publish. I'm going to go into Facebook groups and I'm going to share that content with these groups where uh, gardening tips for beginners. I'm going to join this group. I'm going to keep my eyes open and wait and see is anyone in this community looking for a piece of content about propagating basil. And then I'm going to share that article in there. Or I'm going to go to this subreddit, make sure you read the rules, and then I'm going to review and understand how can I share this piece of content in the gardening subreddit. So again, you're distributing that piece of content through a wide variety of different places. You're not just relying on one tweet, one email, and then calling it a day. You're starting to distribute that content consistently across these various communities. Again, another opportunity here that is often overlooked is the fact that if a post goes viral, let's say in a subreddit, that is an opportunity for you to be the first person. Let's say somebody goes into a subreddit like gardening and they say, I'm trying to figure out what I should do with my basil leaves and how I can save them for the winter. You go in, you add so much value in your comment that you're also linking back to the video that you created, a YouTube video, a blog post, whatever it may be. You're linking to that content with the first comment in that thread and you have an opportunity to generate traffic and traction just from adding value to somebody else's life who was asking a question. Um, again, another opportunity for distribution is you remix your content into multiple assets. So back in, I believe, 2019, 2018, I created this piece about what marketers need to know about Reddit before submitting their content. It was, I think it was back in 2015, to be honest. It was quite a while ago. So I created this piece about what you need to know before you go into Reddit. I then took that piece and republished it as an article on LinkedIn a few months later. And then a few years later, I took that same concept, all of the same materials, and I turned it into a YouTube video. And you'll notice here it says how to make the most out of Reddit in 2020. That video has been updated two times. It went from 2018 to 2019 to now 2020. And again, it's all based on this idea of embracing the remix and updating your content the same way that Disney would do it to theirs, where they take the Lion King and they add new life to it. Um, you're remixing old content for new formats for new channels another opportunity here would be recognizing okay instagram stories maybe i'm going to record an instagram story or i'm just going to take this actual video and upload it to my story itself and have it reformatted in a way that can live on that channel again you want to remix old content into new assets and again the key word there is assets these are things that you create once and you can use and distribute forever um, now, with this, though, comes the importance of experimentation. I know some of you are thinking, Russ, I can't do all this. I don't want to embrace this. But here's the thing, folks. The more you embrace experimentation, the more likelihood you are going to have in uncovering a marketing breakthrough. Uh, again, in that same study that Christine Mormon did, she was doing a survey to ask folks, like, what percentage of time uh, do you perform experiments to understand the impact of your marketing actions on customers? Uh, and there is an increase in the amount of people experimenting in the CMO role time and time again. This is why it's important. If you do not want to expire as a marketer, as a professional, you want to experiment because your peers are starting to catch on to the idea that experimentation is key. So you want to embrace the idea of doing that. So right now you might be listening to all of this. We talked about a whole lot of different concepts, a whole lot of different ideas. You're thinking, bro, where do I start? Ross, this is a lot. This is a whole bunch of new ideas. I'm a small person team. I don't know what to do. Your overload is like ridiculous. What do I do next? Here's what you have to do. Remember the fundamentals of the entire presentation, which is this. It's okay to create pieces of content at the forefront that doesn't necessarily hit. You don't always need to have a home run. You just have to start. If you start creating content with good intentions, with good vibes, and that's where you start your intention of understanding, we're going to create great content. Some of our content pieces aren't necessarily going to be a home run, but with these assets, the ones that we do develop, the ones we do invest in, we're going to repurpose them. We're going to reuse them. If you can find that commitment internally, where you have a culture that is okay with experimentation and is okay with launching Lion King one and a half, if you're okay with creating some content that doesn't necessarily turn into classics, right? you're gonna be okay. Because we all remember the movies that change our lives. We all remember the movies that stand out amongst our childhood. And when you create a few pieces of content that truly shape culture within the industries, within the companies of the people you're trying to reach, and is ultimately able to shape culture amongst society, even if you're in the world of B2C or if you're in the healthcare space, if you can create content that does that, then you are 10 steps ahead of everybody else who is just pressing publish on pieces of content and hoping 
that their content will reach people because you have now developed an engine that is not only a focus around creation, but also about distribution. So you want to embrace that methodology that Walt Disney, that Disney has kind of mapped out for you. You want to have a creation process. You want to have a distribution process and you want to embrace them within your company and within your organization 24 seven, 365 days a year, because that is how you impact culture with your content. And yes, that might sound very highbrow. That might sound very ambitious. That might sound very intense, but it is the reality. The reality is all you have to do is start to think about the content that you want to create, dream about the outcomes that you want to actually have um, your audience, your customers kind of see at the end of it, believe that you can do it, and then dare to make a risk and dare to take a chance on creating some pieces of content that are truly worth getting close to the screen for. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for taking some time over your day. I hope you found this valuable. Um, by all means, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. My website is rawsimmons.com and I'd be happy to connect um, on Twitter. But let's open it up to some questions and I would be happy to answer them uh, now. So let's jump in. Awesome, Russ. This was very insightful. So before we jump into the questions, uh, because I got lots of messages, everybody's asking about that phone number uh, that you wanted yeah. Uh, this and I, I only ca caught the 646. So I'm like, I don't have it either. <laughs> so it's trying to right. go back. No worries. I'll, I'll pull that back up for everybody. There you go. Ah, somebody actually, Ben just shared, shared it 6031335. Let's see. That's it. Ah, there you go. Six. Yeah. So just text me distro sheet and I'll flip that over to you. That is awesome. That is awesome. The, the, this, this was uh, very, very insightful. Um, I'm grateful to have you over here. We have, we have a few questions. One of the things, I'll, I'll share this quickly. Um, I, I always tell people I've been on LinkedIn since 2007, but I've been on LinkedIn right. just in January 2020. And lots of times people yeah. ask me, how do you come up with content? And I'm like, you know what? We produce massive content. So I went back and looked at the, our most successful content pieces. And I'm like, oh, I can share those as posts on LinkedIn. So I started right. doing that. And then after that, and they're smaller, of course. I, so I picked pieces of them. Then I'm like, oh, the successful ones, I can actually record videos of those. So I started right. recording videos of those. And then I'm like, oh, well, it worked really well on LinkedIn. Same videos, but just different format. It goes to YouTube and goes yep. to Instagram. And it's, again, starts with one piece of content that was just sitting there for years. And I'm like, oh, exactly. just, let's re redo this. Let, let's look at the Q&A. Uh, so Mauricio asks, when we're removing content, how does search engines see this? Do we uh, do a 301 redirect? Your suggestions? Uh, last time, Great question. So I'm going to run live on this. And I know, folks, um, it's always recommended that you don't do live demos on things, but I'm going to try to <laughs> But do those are the most fun demos. ones, correct? It is the most fun. It is. So essentially, I have a um, flowchart that I think everyone will find valuable in this, it's a flowchart that essentially shows how you should um, make the decision on whether or not you should redirect your content or whether or not you should, um, here it is, it's called the content audit decision tree. So if a piece of content has over 10 backlinks and is generating like hundreds of visits a month, what do you do? You ask yourself, okay, yes, it does have that. This post can either be revised or improved. If it can be revised, then yes, you improve it. If you can't, then you redirect it. So that's when you would redirect it. If that piece of content that you've created is essentially a duplicate, it has some backlinks, it's got value, it's in the eyes of Google as a great piece of content, you redirect that to a piece of content that has more value for your business. That's when you're gonna do a redirect. If a piece of content doesn't have any value in the sense that it's not generating backlinks, it's not generating traffic, et cetera, but it's still relatively interesting, you're gonna just republish that. So that's a piece of content you're gonna bring back to life, you're gonna um, maybe create a video for, you might embed that video, you're gonna republish it, et cetera. But if the content isn't relevant, isn't interesting, those are the pieces that you're gonna remove. So you're gonna go through this methodology to decide whether or not you redirect, whether you revise that piece or republish it or remove it. So hopefully that provides you with a little bit of insight into the way I would approach it. Um, but the redirect to answer your question specifically is only going to happen if the piece of content has value from the sense that it has over 10 backlinks and it is generating on average, or you can use the median um, of your website traffic uh, above the median of your traffic to your website. And that's when you would do a redirect. 
How, how can we, how can the audience get access to this? How, what did you do to find this uh, diagram? Because really yeah, so I just did a quick Twitter search for it, um, but I did put up a post on my LinkedIn account with it as well. Um, so I'll, I'd say screenshot my screen um, and you can get this and use it within your, your internal organization. But this is the methodology that I would recommend you use. Awesome, awesome, very good answer. Uh, Dania is asking, I'm in one of those boring industries, law. I fear yes. that if I start being fun, people will no longer see me as professional, take me seriously. What advice do you have for content creating when you want to stand out, but still be professional? Great question. So I think there's a, um, there's a spectrum of fun, right? And on the spectrum, most lawyers, most law firms are seen at being at the very bottom. That's okay. You, that means you don't need to necessarily go all the way through to being Eddie Murphy, Kevin Hart style level of comedy and hilarity. Like that's not where you need to be. If your folks that you're trying to target are already at the bottom level of fun, all you need to do is go up like three or four notches. And as marketers, because we're exposed to so many extreme personalities, we believe we need to be the Kevin Hart's of our industry when our clients don't really need to get there. They just need to be the Oprah's and Oprah's not even funny, but she's engaging and she's interesting. And if you can be in that sector for your space, then that's enough. So what I would do is essentially think about it this way. Um, I always say there's no such thing as boring industries. There's just a lot of boring marketers and the key to avoiding the trap of being a boring marketer is to leverage that idea of the Sherlock homeboy approach. So reverse engineer the content that lawyers that your audience wants on a regular basis, understand it, and then apply within your spectrum, within that Walt, so to speak, your brand story, your own spin to that type of content because you know they're gonna resonate with it. How do you do that? You go to a subreddit and you type in law and you see what pieces of content are lawyers going wild about? What cases can you talk about that are interesting? Um, there's a lot of fun you can have with it the closer you get to your audience and really start to understand the nuances of it. I also believe, um, sorry, long story longer. Um, the, I also believe that we live in an interesting time where personality in brands and in um, business is actually becoming more and more embraced. So I wouldn't, um, avoid it too much. Like you don't have to water yourself down if you have a personality that embraces being fun, et cetera. Um, I think we are living in a time where that's starting to be more and more accepted across all industries. So you might be actually a front runner uh, to do something special within your space, even though you think it's a bit risky. Uh, I, I love that answer. Uh, I'll, I'll just add a couple of points. I don't know why whenever we're in B2B, we think we have to put on this hat. I call it the yeah. hat. Uh, so we work, one of our clients is one of the largest SEO companies and right. their, their CEO is just fun to hang out with, have dinners right. with. You come to the site and it's boring. And I'm like, right. why? Wow. He's like, I can't be like that. I'm like, but when a client talks to you and they enjoy going out to dinner with you, you're this different person. Why do you assume yeah. on your site you, you have to be this boring? And in parallel, I, my brother-in-law is a lawyer. So I never knew that he's on social media. Right. He spent a week with us. Right. So I'm like, can yeah. I watch him? And he's like, what? I'm like, can I? I just would like to see. And he's on Twitter and he's clicking on all these different articles. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, I didn't know you do that. He's like, he's like I'm just like you. I'm, you know, he's like mergers and acquisition, billions of dollars. And I'm yeah. like, you know, the content he's consuming. So there's an yeah. assumption there that we make. That there is. Yeah, 100%. I, yeah, I think uh, if you focus on educational, engaging, or entertaining content, people will resonate with it. And don't be afraid to take a Disney approach and remix what has worked in the past. That's awesome. Uh, Kristen is asking, what would you say is a good uh, uh, ra ration for time to invest in creation versus promoting 50-50 or 20-80? What are your thoughts on that? So this is a great question. And the reason why it's great is because we oftentimes ask um, around that ratio, um, but it all comes down to your perspective of length of time. If you create a piece of content that takes 20 hours, right? Let's say it took you 20 hours to create a piece of content. Better be good. That's a lot of time to put into something. That's a big investment. So if you were to say it's 50, 50, that means you're going to spend 20 hours distributing it. How long are you going to spend that 20 hours? Is that 20 hours going to be spread in the next two weeks? If so, great, then you're 50-50. But when you have a long-term view, where you start to think about your assets in terms of a life cycle of years, where that piece of content published in Q1 should still be promoted in Q4 the next year, then it shouldn't be 50-50. 
it should be more like 10% to, or 80, 20, right? Like 80% distribution, 20% creation. And the reason why is because you only create once you should distribute forever, right? I always say distribute once, distribute a million times. Like you always want to be in that mode of distribute. So the lifetime value of that asset doesn't stop after two weeks. It doesn't stop after two months. That piece of content that I published in 2018 is still being promoted. I just got an email from somebody who read a piece that I created back in 2016 about Instagram marketing. And it's a very dated piece, but this person just asked me if I can jump on a call because they're a B2B brand. They just raised a bunch of funding and they can't figure out Instagram. We created this piece back in 2015, but my team just happened to send out a tweet about it. And now a, an exec wants to buy something because of that piece. Promote your content long-term. Um, the ratio changes when your mindset changes around the, the importance of time. Russ, let me ask you this. Most marketers don't, fo don't focus on content distribution, correct? We just put it out there and just hope for it. Yeah. Why, why do you think that's the case? Is it ignorance? Is it, it's, 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 it's really is harder, by the way. I mean, we've been doing it now yeah, for it months, is harder. much harder. Yeah. Why do you think like, no, we ignore the, the distribution aspect? There's two reasons. Um, one is the content culture that has existed within our industry for so long where we've preached at the top of our lungs, content is king create more content, create more content, you will be king. All you have to do is create great content. We've preached, the gurus have preached it on stages at conferences from coast to coast, and the industry has listened. That's why there's so much content being created. But that's what has been instilled in us as being the goal. The goal is to create. What we're not recognizing is that's not the end game. The end game is to also distribute. Um, so the culture of content marketing and of business in marketing has been prioritizing creation over distribution. Now, the second part of the mix that makes it difficult is the fear of being judged. And that sounds like some therapy level stuff, but it's true. Marketers have the fear of being judged. When you share a piece of content that you've created publicly, when you're distributing it, you have a fear that hmm, maybe people aren't going to like it. There's this like when you press publish, I remember in uh, MailChimp, they used to have the sweaty monkey's finger uh, when you were about to press send on their apps. Like that's how we feel when we press send on things uh, because we're afraid to have bad feedback. I think you have to recognize it's okay to promote yourself. Every day that you go with oh, promoting your content and getting it in front of your audience, the people you want to reach is another day that your audience is going without having an answer to a question that you could have solved. So you're not helping your customers every day you don't promote your content. So you should feel bad for not promoting your content because you're not helping your clients because of it. I, I, I love that, I love that. Kristen has another really good question. How do you organize the scheduling of all these different posts if you're on LinkedIn, you're yeah. on Instagram? And there, there's not a single schedule that works for all the B2B yeah. channels. Uh, th th thoughts on that? She, she, she elaborated, but this is, I think, the summary. I, I hope I didn't miss anything. Yeah, great question. So there's a few different ways to go about it, and it definitely changes depending on your scale of your company. Um, like if you're talking enterprise level, you're going to have a process. You're going to have a process where you have a content creation team, and then you're going to have a distribution team. And your distribution team is probably going to be siloed into channel specific, and the content creation team is going to brief your distribution team. The distro team goes out. They come back, and they say, this is the plan for every asset, and then they spread it. That's enterprise level. When you start to go a step further down and you're starting to talk about small, medium-sized businesses, for those organizations, the way that I always say it is a direct reflection in the early days of the way that my parents would talk about raising kids. I've got some siblings, but my parents always said it's better to have one good kid than three bad. And I think the same thing exists when it comes to content distribution, folks. It's better to start by investing in fine tuning your distribution process on one specific channel before you start throwing new channels in the mix. Fine tune your process and your craft on LinkedIn. If that is a channel where you know validated, this is where my audience is. Knock it out of the park. And then once you've done that, let's start talking about Twitter. Then once you've cracked that one, okay, we now have a process. Let's go to the next channel. And across each of these, you're able to figure out a checklist. The checklist that I'm going to share in the distro sheet will assist with helping you figure out what that would look like. But then you're going to create a Trello board that is, or any type of project management board that essentially goes back to um, the model that Disney uses where you're going through this and you're saying, okay, when we press publish on a piece of content, it's then going to go out as a uh, tweet 
It's going to go in as a Twitter thread. It's going to go to our email list. It's going to go out to our subreddit community. It's going to go on our Slack. We're going to write this, etc. So you frame it so you have your own internal process for every single piece of asset. Now, from a timing standpoint, you're just going to look at this piece and say, okay, if we share it on Facebook on week one, we're going to share it on Facebook again in month two, right? So you just put it in your calendar within your content calendar when you're going to redistribute these pieces of content. And that's the model. Um, you do have to take a step back and do some planning, but start with one channel. And then once you've done that, you've gotten to a process, then start adding new ones to the, to the mix, unless you're an enterprise level, then I think it comes down to creating a, uh, an engine that exists separately and then adding um, processes within each. Awesome. Awesome. Um, uh, here's a quick one, uh, text or video. What do you prefer? Which works better? Great question. So Google still loves written text. Um, and for my audience, they still read a lot. So written word works well in my space. Uh, it's going to be different for every space though, right? Like if I'm running a gardening blog, I'm not writing a bunch of big long form blog posts. I'm probably going to invest in um, video content. If I'm running an e-commerce store, I'm definitely not going to invest in written word. I'm probably going to double down on video content. Uh, it's all going to depend on your space and it all depends on doing that upfront work. The Sherlock Homeboy methodology really works, folks. You have to study the habits of your customers, your audience, the people you're trying to reach and start to figure out what content do they like. Um, if your audience is not big into reading, then don't invest into that. If your audience is big into video, then invest in that. But one thing I will say that I do believe is I am long video content. And what I mean by that is like if there was something to bet on, written text or video, where do I think the biggest opportunity lies long term? If I was to look at like the longevity of my career, video content. And the reason why is this. More people watch movies, more people watch TV than people read books. And that was just an insight that I got. One day I was sitting here and I was writing a blog post and I was like, wait a minute, nobody else reads a bunch of books. Like I read a bunch of books, marketers read a bunch of books, but the vast majority of the world don't like books. They don't read them after university. They don't read them after high school. The vast majority of people hate them. They just want to watch a documentary. They want to see a movie. They want to watch TVs. They want to watch reality TV, et cetera because video is a very passive form of consumption. So video long, I do believe is a massive opportunity for folks. Um, I think it can be very powerful for sure. Awesome, awesome. We have uh, two more questions. I, I appreciate everybody sticking around. It's been an hour and 15 minutes, but that just speaks also to the, to the value that they're getting out of this. Um, a question, um, I've read some of your well-researched pieces of content, um, uh, like the one on Canva, Canva. I was wondering what tools do you use to create that kind of uh, research? Great question. So uh, we wrote a piece on Canva called uh, the development of a backlink empire. Do a quick Google search. You can find it. Um, but essentially with this piece, we reverse engineered how Canva was able to grow their success. Um, essentially it comes down to a few different tools. We use things, we put together a lot of different tools. Um, we use things like Ahrefs, we use Moz, we use similar web, uh, we use BuzzSumo, um, but also we have internally built our own proprietary tools and software that we actually gather data from APIs and we actually run analysis on. So um, we've run Ngram analysis against things like G2 Crowd to study like what are things that people are saying amongst the reviews of different sites. So we actually create our own software oftentimes after foundation to run proprietary research to ensure, and this is giving you a bit of a glimpse into our own methodology for how we believe we can grow, is to establish a bit of a competitive advantage is we just create our own tools, things that are very difficult to replace and replicate so people can't just do what we do in many ways. So um, we have invested in creating our own software to do those different Different things to create pieces like that. Um, but also it's that Sherlock Homeboy methodology. I think you just have to be curious, folks. Like if you're curious and you dive deep into the numbers and the data and you're into that, I'm a geek at heart. So it just comes naturally to me. Like I get anxious when I don't do it. So when I am doing it, I'm in my happy place. So I think that's what it comes down to. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Mandy is asking, what's your, uh, what's your advice to distribute old and new content parallelly in uh, B2B SaaS newsletters? Oh, great question. So I'm a huge fan of newsletters. I think they're a, um, 
I have a hypothesis that the next wave of great hires in the world of B2B SaaS is going to be hiring people who run newsletters. And then those people are going to become within your content marketing engine, essentially people who you can use to distribute your stories. Uh, I don't know if people are going to do it. I'm planning to do it, but I think that's going to be a, a massive opportunity for folks. So um, long story longer again, sorry, I go on these rambles for, for a second there, but I'll get back on track. The opportunity with newsletters is massive. You want to identify newsletters that are specifically targeted to your niche, that your audience is subscribed to. You can use tools like SparkToro to even find some of these newsletters now, which is great. I definitely recommend you get 10 free searches on that tool. Um, you can then reach out to the people who run them and build a relationship. This is where people make the mistake. They go in immediately and they're like, I just wrote this post. Can you share it with your newsletter? Instead, you're going to subscribe to all of these newsletters. When they start sending out, let's say three or four newsletters, you're gonna start replying to them. Every person who runs a newsletter reads the responses to their emails. So you reply to it and you say, this was an amazing newsletter. I loved it so much. Thanks for sharing, et cetera. Share a personalized reason why you liked it. Guess what you just have? You just established a relationship with somebody who's an influencer in your space. Two weeks later, you then respond to another one and you say, love this piece. I just wrote this piece. I would love to know your take, love your thoughts, etc. That person is then more likely to plug your link because you have a relationship with them. You're not just a random Joe who sent them a note. You're a subscriber, somebody who they've engaged with in the past and you added value to their life. So they're going to try to give you value back. That would be the methodology I would take. Um, or you can take the cold approach. Again, it's not as effective, I don't think, long term. But if you need short term wins, you just go in cold. If you want to play the long game, build the relationship. Uh, I'm all for the long game. I tell you what, every day in the morning, I wake up and there's usually 20 or 30 emails that yeah. are asking for a link. And, and sometimes yeah. it's funny because they even put the wrong site name. And I'm like, dude, at least. Right, I'm right. Okay. What are you doing? Exactly. But so, I tell you what, like, you know, over the last three, four weeks, and I haven't thought about this, there's this one gentleman who's been responding to our newsletter and he sends the responses. Yeah. Me and then to my partner and we've noticed him we know the guy by name because we read them like oh you know their name exactly, exactly. Yeah. versus the other 30 people that i get every day and i'm like delete or just mark them exactly yeah delete right away but if somebody's exactly. responding to your actual emails oh the relationship there is real um it's uh, it's an opportunity for folks for sure that's awesome. Russ, thank you so much. You can see from the comments, everybody loved it. Uh, we will have a recording up uh, in the next couple of days. I thank you, everyone. Uh, cool. I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. Uh, I think everyone awesome. uh, you know, also benefited from this. Thank you, Russ, for, for also Great. taking the time. I know how busy you are, so we, we appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with us. No worries. No problem at all. Thanks so much for having me, folks. Really hope we can stay connected. Add me to LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter. I love to stay connected. Um, always great to connect with like-minded marketers. So my friends, please reach out. I'd be happy to stay connected. Definitely. Uh, like, like I tell you guys, uh, right away, connect with Russell on LinkedIn. Uh, that's why I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter might be great. Fair, fair. <laughs> I, I fair. cannot figure out Twitter like I used to. That's point. all right. But that's LinkedIn awesome. is absolutely yeah. awesome. And that's how we made this. Uh, this that's how we made it. Come together. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me on, Cali. Really appreciate it. Uh, and hope everyone was able to get some value here. Cheers. Take care, guys.